Welcome to the Peggy V. Helmrich Distinguished Author Award public presentation. I'm Library Chief Executive Officer Gary Schaefer, and I'm delighted to have you all here this morning at the Hardesty Regional Library and uh, our Connors Cove uh, Theater. Uh, this morning promises to be very exciting as we spend some time getting to know critically acclaimed novelist Ann Patchett. For 30 years, the library has awarded the Peggy V. Helmrich Distinguished Author Award and brought to town an internationally known writer to share his or her works with our community. This is all possible because of the generosity of Peggy Helmrich and her family. Uh, Mrs. Helmrich will be with us shortly, but she said, please go ahead and start so we can all clap when she comes in, okay? <laughs> uh, let's give her a big thank you right now. I would also like to have Kristen Bender stand. Uh, she was this year's award-winning uh, di dinner chairman. I'm going to give you an award later. Thank you. Our dinner last night was truly fabulous. It kicks off the holiday season in, in Tulsa, and um, Anne did a great job, and I'm sure she will delight you all today. Um, the Helmrichs and many other families, foundations, and donors generously give of their resources, time, and talents to bring many special events and services to the library through the Tulsa Library Trust Endowments. The trust enables us to bring you special programs such as this, programs that are above and beyond the library's day-to-day -day services, which are provided by taxpayer dollars. The trust adds the little something extra to our top-notch service, allowing us to reach our customers in new and exciting ways. The trust is made up of countless community partners and sponsors, and we appreciate each of them. Before we introduce our award winner this morning, we have a special induction we would like to make. More than 30 years ago, the Tulsa City County Library and Tulsa Library Trust established the Library Hall of Fame to recognize and honor individuals and organizations who have provided leadership and made exemplary contributions in time, talent, and energy toward the development of the Tulsa City County Library. Since the library opened its American Indian Resource Center 15 years ago, the Cherokee Nation has supported the center, library, and community by providing presenters for educational programs, as well as monetary donations to purchase resources for the library's con uh, collections. In 2006, the library was honored to recognize the Cherokee Nation's first female principal chief, Wilma Mankiller, by inducting her into the circle of honor. One of Tulsa City County Library's goals is that the library be a center for community, reading, lifelong learning, and access to information for all. Thanks to the hard work of the Cherokee Nation and the American Indian Resource Center, Mango Languages, which is one of our vendors that works with the library, will begin offering for the first time an indigenous language, um, the Cherokee language course, beginning in early 2015. The Cherokee Nation helped develop interactive lessons and provided native speakers to record each lesson um, that will be offered through the user-friendly language instruction tool, which is free from, will be available free from the library's website, as well as about 2,000 other public libraries across the United States. Um, so it's really a, a remarkable uh, part of collaboration, and that, and that was really brought together by um, work from the American Indian Resource Center at the Tulsa City County Library, bringing these two um, partners together to develop this. And, and the, the developers are here this morning to be honored, and we're very excited about it. I would also be remiss if I did not thank the Tribal Council to their longstanding support and continuous donations to the library. It's just an amazing partnership between the library, American Indian Resource Center, and the Cherokee Nation. Thank you. For the Cherokee's Nation outstanding commitment and long-standing support of the Tulsa City County Library and for its diligence to preserve its native language, we are proud to induct the Cherokee Nation into the Library Hall of Fame. So if I could ask um, Dr. Teehee, language speakers John Ross and Anna Sixkiller, the two of them who worked diligently on this, Jay Calhoun from Cherokee Businesses, Ray Boney who worked on this as well, um, if they could come forward. Um, as well as Councillor Cowan Watts. And, um, thank you. Good morning. And uh, I think, in the spirit of 
of this partnership, we should uh, also say OCO. <laughs> so you're already learning Cherokee <laughs> today. So uh, these are some, some great teachers that we have up here uh, for our language. Language is very important to us as it's, uh, it's our, part of our identity and our culture. Um, it's a great privilege for us to accept this award and really have the opportunity to work with um, folks like Mango Languages and Tulsa City County Library on this important initiative. Uh, Gary and Teresa approached, approached us a few months ago, early this spring, I think, uh, about this unique opportunity to really put our language programs in a unique um, medium and really give it much more reach than it had previously. Um, I'm a very novice Cherokee speaker trying to learn the language. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with um, native speakers uh, to help me with some of my vocabulary and uh, pronunciation of, of words and connecting those into kind of coherent sentences just to some extent. One thing that uh, I struggled with uh, uh, growing up as an at-large citizen was the practice. Uh, when I'd have a, a native speaker there in front of me uh, helping me and coaching me through the words and the phrases uh, it seemed a little bit easier. But then when I got home and I had my note cards and trying to practice it, I knew I was probably pron uh, pronouncing the words wrong uh, and reinforcing uh, some of my mistakes. Now, luckily, I don't have a lot of pride, so I, I don't mind <laughs> practicing and have, have folks like uh, these experts uh, you know, correct me on that. But... Uh, having this type of, of program uh, at our fingertips uh, available uh, at, our, at our local library uh, on our phones uh, and across the U.S. is, a, is a, a major, major deal for us. Um, so it really helps us kind of bridge that gap for our Cherokee people and for our at-large people. We have about the largest tribe in the U.S. We have about 320,000 tribal citizens. About two-thirds of those actually live at large, uh, which means that they don't live within our uh, traditional jurisdictional area uh, here in the 14 counties north of Oklahoma. And so having this available uh, for our citizens is a really big deal for us because it really connects us uh, and preserves and um, um, enhances uh, who we are as a people, who are, it's our identity, uh, which is our language. Um, for those that don't get to get a chance to come back to our traditional Cherokee communities on a regular basis. So this is very important to us. Uh, plus, it, it gives anyone else the opportunity who'd like to, to learn Cherokee that opportunity as well. Um, so with this, this program, Cherokees will soon be able to come to your, your local library, this beautiful facility, uh, to, to access by using their own library cards, which I have one here and I hope you all do as well. Uh, and on this library card, I was reading, it says, Libraries Change Lives. And I think this is a, a good example of how it is changing lives, uh, but also helping to pre uh, preserve our identity uh, and our heritage. So I'm very thankful for our libraries, especially uh, the one that we're sitting in today. Uh, I'd like to thank Gary and Teresa with the Tulsa City County Library for, for bringing this opportunity to us. I'd like to thank the team at uh, Mango Languages for producing and providing the platform in which we can, can do this. So they've made a, a serious investment in that as well. Uh, I'd very much like to thank, and you'll be able to, to hear the, their voices soon, uh, John and Anna uh, for lending their talents, their voices, um, and their dedication to this program. Roy, who oversees our language program. Uh, Candessa. Um, also, some people that did a lot of the, the back uh, back of the office, behind the scenes work uh, with our attorney general's office, putting those uh, contracts together where we can, we can have a good working relationship, uh, including the Secretary of State, uh, Hoskin, uh, our principal chief, um, and the leadership that our tribe has provided, uh, our tribal council, uh, for acknowledging that protecting and revitalizing our language is so important, but also the willingness uh, to engage in partnerships and utilize technologies 
to help make this more accessible to everyone. So I really appreciate it. What up? And what did you have a couple words to say? <laughs> These are the folks that, that, that do the real work. I just got to say thank you. So. <laughs> uh, OCO Nagad. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, it's kind of fitting that uh, the library is uh, doing this for us because as Cherokees, we have a long history of literacy and education. Uh, education is one of our major uh, uh, goals as a people as long as we've been a people. Uh, we had the very first uh, institution of higher learning west of the Mississippi. And so in, you know, Sequoia invented our writing system. So we do have quite, a, we're proud of our literacy in this project. Uh, is keeping it with that. Uh, the Cherokee language, like most languages, is, is you know, endangered. Uh, and we don't want to lose our language, so we use every tool possible that's available to us to keep it. So a, a project like this, using this language learning software, is a pretty big thing for us. Uh, it provides people access to hear uh, fluent speakers of Cherokee speaking the language. So like Jay mentioned, uh, if you don't have access to that and you can't hear it, this is a really great tool to learn. Uh, we're in the, this is a couple chapters of it. We, we hope to add more to it and keep it growing, but it's a, without the work of uh, John Ross and Anna Sixkiller, this wouldn't be possible. Uh, they lent their talents to this. They worked with the linguists at Mango, and uh, you know, we came with a pretty good product, so you know, I'd like to give them a special recognition here. Good. I would also like to uh, extend my welcome uh, not only to all of you, thanks for coming, but also we have some library commissioners in the audience I see. I see um, Commissioner Judy Randall, Commissioner Sally Frazier, and is there, uh, I've got someone else. Um, if you guys could stand up and be acknowledged, any other commissioners that are here that... <laughs> We can't do what we do without the support of our volunteers, and that goes from people who help us every day in the library processing books to people who sit on our library commission and sit on our trust board, so thank you all. Um, next, I would like to invite up Ken Lackey, who chaired the Peggy V. Helmrich Distinguished Author Selection Committee, who will introduce our special guest. Ken. Well, good morning. I'll, I'll make this short and sweet because uh, Ann Padgett is really a superstar and you'll want to hear her. But I'll, I need to tell you just a little bit about her because she's had a very interesting life. She's written six very widely acclaimed novels, but she's also an author of nonfiction and uh, really a great series of essays about her uh, struggles and determination to become a writer. <clears throat> In talking about her life, though, she's, she's done a number of things. She's had stints as a waitress, a cook, an editor, a college professor, a magazine writer, so she's done any number of things. At one time, she thought she might go into law enforcement and even qualified for the Los Angeles Police Academy. I really love that story. <laughs> uh, she really has a deep love for dogs. She's got a dog, Sparky, who's her shop dog, sh shelter dog that uh, uh, I, I guess is her guaranteed source of pleasure. She loves parks, and, and Nashville's got a lot of beautiful parks. Tulsa's got a lot of beautiful parks, so we have some things in common there. I think the thing that Ann Pageant is most proud of, though, and, I, and certainly I'm being a business person, I'm proud of her, too. She's an entrepreneur. When Nashville lacked a, good, lacked a uh, really good bookstore, or uh, to say a bookstore, uh, she and a friend started Parnassus Books, and she still runs it today. She talked about that last night. And uh, <clears throat> I wish we could talk her into coming to Tulsa and opening a good bookstore, too, so that'd be great. <laughs> I won't bore you with all the awards she's won, because virtually everything she's written has won an award, and I'm serious about that. But I'll tell you a couple of things that she's, she's won. She did win the Penn Faulkner Award um, for um, uh, one of her books. And uh, she won the Orange Prize, which is given annually. It's a, it's a, a prize in the United Kingdom for a full-length novel written by a, a woman of any nationality, written in English. She won that. So both of those, in fact, for Bel Canto. 
And in closing, I'll just leave you with one quote that I, I really liked in reading about her. She, when she was asked to advise an aspiring author, she said simply, read. Read everything you can get your hands on and try to understand how the author made you feel a certain way. So, Ann Paget. I, I was raised by nuns, which is a little bit like saying I was raised by wolves. Um, <laughs> but the nuns used to always say to us, don't forget you will be judged by the company that you keep. Now, what they meant when they said that was that we shouldn't run around with the fast girls because we would get a bad reputation. But it works the other way, too. You will be judged by the company that you keep when you keep good company. So I'm very honored to be sharing the stage today with the Cherokee Nation and with all that you're doing on behalf of the library and language. It's, as somebody who works a lot with libraries and the written word and language, it's very meaningful for me to be here with you. So thank you. Um, I'm going to talk today about work, which is something that I'm becoming more and more obsessed with over time. Um, I'll start with this story. In Nashville, I, um, I'm at the Whole Foods one morning. I'm frankly at the Whole Foods one morning most mornings because it, it, the skill set that I lack, that I most long to have, is the ability to go grocery shopping once a week, but I wind up going every day. Uh, and I'm in Nashville, not in the world, but in Nashville, I'm, I'm pretty well known. And in Whole Foods, I'm extremely well known. <laughs> and so it's, say it's a Tuesday, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, I'm wearing jeans and a sweatshirt, and uh, I have a lot of groceries, and two people get in line behind me, and they have one thing. Uh, it's a man and a woman. And I say, being from Nashville, I'm sure, it's like this in Tulsa, uh, you know, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, they, no, 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 we're not in any rush, no. I said, I've got all this food. Please, go ahead. You're just so nice. Really, not a problem. You know, do you remember Chip and Dale, the little chipmunks? No, no, after you. So we did this for a little while, and the man and the woman with their one jar of marmalade go ahead of me. And they check out, thank you. Oh, you're so nice. Not a problem. Such a pleasure. I'm not in any rush. You go on. So they, they leave, and I'm checking out. And then a couple of minutes later, they come back. Uh, just the man. The man comes back and he says, uh, I want to talk to you for a minute. I said, sure. He says, uh, what do you do? Well, you know, it's Whole Foods and I'm famous in Whole Foods. Uh, so, you know, basically in Nashville, it's me, Nicole Kidman and Connie Britton. We sort of, we, we rule the town. Um, so I said, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. And he was like, oh, that is great. That is such good news. He said, I am a lawyer, and my, my business partner and I have just moved to town, and we're setting up a legal office. He said, you are exactly the person we want to see at the front desk. <laughs> he said, you know, you're terrific. You're so friendly, and you're well-spoken. You have a super nice smile, and that's just what we want our clients to see when they come in the office. And I was like, um, I, have, I have a job. I'm, I'm a writer. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, that's great. Um, hey, listen, let me just give you my card. And I, I want you to come in. I want to take you to lunch. I think this could really go somewhere. Um, this came really right on the heels of me being offered a job for the holiday season at Banana Republic. Because... <laughs> While I was waiting in line next to a very cluttered table, I started folding the sweaters. <laughs> and the manager came over and he was like, what are you doing in December, girl? Um, this, this, of course, is a problem because, you know, if you, if you see a woman in Whole Foods on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, not dressed very well, and she says she's a writer, that really is the equivalent of saying she doesn't work. And, and this goes way back in my life to my father who wanted very much for me to be a dental hygienist because he was certain that this writing thing wasn't going to work out. And that's fine. I mean, he, he, said, he meant it with a lot of love. He wanted me to be safe. He wanted me to be thinking of the future. He thought that the chances of my making it as a writer were the same as my chances of someday owning Disneyland. Uh, but he really carried it too far. And he continued to ask me 
when I was going to get a job long, long after I had a successful career as a writer. So that one day, I was working on my third novel, Magician's Assistant. My father called in the afternoon. He said, hey, honey, what you doing? I said, oh, not much. I'm just working. And he said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Did you get a job? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dad, I got a job. Um, now, I think that a lot of this is because of writers. It's the writer's fault that people think that writing isn't a job because writers really like to perpetrate the myth of inspiration and this idea that the characters take over. Everybody loves that story. I have to say, even in Tulsa, and you are a very, very smart town, I have had so many people take me aside and say, so isn't it true that the characters just kind of take over and write the novel? You know what? They don't. They don't. And they don't for anybody. You know? It, it, and yes, I have a plan when I write a book. And yes, I often change my mind. But if you're building a house and you decide to put the master bedroom on the second floor and then later on you think before you start building the house, no, I'm going to move the, second, the master down to the first floor, does that mean that the architectural plans took over and made the decision to move the bedroom? Or does that mean that you changed your mind? But we love this idea that writing is magic and that you're typing, typing away, and all of a sudden the character just grabs your will from you and you're just, it's like you're possessed, you know, your hands just flopping around on the keyboard and, and a novel is coming out. Well, think about this with other professions, right? Okay, say you had a brain tumor and you, you went to see your neurosurgeon, and your neurosurgeon says, you know, this is the way it works. I, I do a skull resection, and, and I start to work on the tumor, and I'm cutting it out, and then all of a sudden, I just don't even know what comes over me. My hands are just cutting and cutting, and I'm not even looking at your head anymore. And you'd be like, okay, all right. And you'd go get another doctor. Well, you should also probably go get another novelist, because if your characters are speaking to you, that's called schizophrenia. Um, Liz Gilbert, Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and Signature of All Things, which is a terrific novel, whose dress I was wearing last night, uh, is a very good friend of mine. And, um, and Liz and I have this story this is absolutely true, and, and we have talked about this even recently. We both talk about this when we both go and give talks. So um, my last novel was called State of Wonder, and it was set in the Amazon. And when I was planning it for a long time and doing research, I told Liz, before I started writing it, I'm working on a book, or I will be working on a book that's set in the Amazon. She said to me, oh, I was working on a book that was set in the Amazon, but it, it turned out that it didn't work out. She said, I've got a lot of extra Amazon books I'll send you. And she did. And, and they were not Amazon books that I wound up needing. They were sort of Amazon books from another time. And she said the character who was going to be the hero, heroine of her Amazon novel was based on her grandmother, and she put that character in another book, and so she wound up not writing the Amazon novel. So anyway, we go to Portland together. Now, when we go to Portland together, and we're doing an onstage event, a conversation, we're staying in the same hotel, we're doing this because we're friends, and this is how you see your writer friends, you make plans to give talks to them, with them in cities you don't live in. So we're having lunch that morning before the talk, and I say, tell me about the book you're working on. Well, at that point, she was just finishing up her memoir called Committed. So she was telling me the story of Committed and what the book was about, and she finished telling me the story, and then she said, okay, now you tell me the story of your Amazon novel. And I said, okay, it's a... No, I said. No, you tell me the story of your Amazon novel. I said, you tell me the story of the Amazon novel you didn't write. She said, well, it starts in Minnesota, and it's about a woman who's a doctor. Uh, she's a research scientist, and she's, she's a spinster, and she's in love with her boss. And somebody in the organization that she works for has gone missing in the Amazon. And her boss sends, for those of you who haven't read State of Wonder, um, you just really got the plot synopsis. So I'm sitting there feeling like I'm going to throw up. And, um, and I said to her, okay, one of two things is going on. 
either this is the most banal idea for an Amazon novel in human history, and anybody who was coming up with an Amazon novel would come up with this exact same plot, or there's something strange, because let me tell you the plot of my Amazon novel, which I have at this point written 100 pages of. I'm not just pulling this out of the air. And Liz says, oh, no, no worries. No, I, I, no, I can tell you exactly what happened. She said, this is the way it works. She said, ideas are like souls. And they, they circle around in the universe looking for somebody who's open to them. And when the idea finds the right person, it goes down and it lands in you. And that becomes your idea, your creative idea. Okay, I'm not loving this. Um, <laughs> For a whole host of reasons. One is what? Like, I'm getting Liz Gilbert's second hand off. <laughs> and she said, well, no, the way it works is that the idea comes to you, and if you're not open to it, if you don't cherish it, if you don't pay attention, if you don't kind of drop everything, an idea is a great opportunity. If you don't drop everything and make that idea feel welcome, you know, it'll hang around for a while, but if it's a really good idea, it will take off and go and look around until it finds somebody else. So clearly, this was my idea, she says, for an Amazon novel. And it waited with me for a long time. But then she ended up writing committed and getting sidetracked. And so it took off and, and it came to me. Um, I, you know, I, the, the thing is, it's really complicated. And I've thought about this for years. And Liz is actually writing a book right now on creativity called Big Magic that will be out in September. And the book starts with this story. And she sent me the first chapters of the book and she said, I want you to read this and tell me if you think this is what really happened. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is absolutely what really happened. And at first I thought, well, it's not that Liz is a flake because she's actually one of the smartest people that I know. It's that we all have very different ideas of how ideas and creativity and stories come to us. And for her, there is an awful lot of magic involved. And for me, it just seems like there is an awful lot of work involved. And when I was young, I believed in the muse. I believed in writer's block. I believed in creativity. I don't believe in any of those things anymore. I believe in work. This is what I think. It's like a match. Creativity, talent, inspiration is a match, right? Being a writer at 51, having written nine books, is like living your whole life in a warm house. You don't live your life in a warm house because of a match. You live your life in a warm house because you have a willingness to split wood day after day after day. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was at UT in Austin a while ago teaching a class for a friend of mine, Elizabeth McCracken, and it was a graduate seminar. And one of the students asked me a really great question. She said, what's the difference between how you write now and how you wrote in graduate school when you were our age? And I said, when I was in graduate school, when I was 21, I wrote the way I fell in love, which is to say, I fell. I fell like off a building. When I fell in love, did you guys used to fall in love? You fell and it was just like there was nothing you could do to stop that fall. You were going straight down. You couldn't protect yourself. You couldn't cover your head. You were falling in love. And I would fall into a short story in the same way. I would, I would cancel all of my obligations or not even cancel them. I just wouldn't show up. I would drink. I would smoke. I would stay up all night, type, 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 type. But you know what? You can't do that for your life. You can't write that way for your life. You can't be in love that way. And I said, you know, the way I write now is also the same way I'm in love. My husband and I have been together for 20 years, and I actually really understand what it takes to be a good partner in a relationship. And I know when I'm being a jerk, and I know when he's being a jerk, and I know how we forgive one another and how we make it through. And I know when I get stuck in the middle of chapter three because I've made a mistake in chapter two, and I have to backtrack. I know 
my own games. I am wise to all of my lies. And I know that in love and in work, in writing, in creativity, it's showing up day after day after day and doing your job. Um, and yet, because my husband is a doctor, uh, I go to these parties, these doctor parties all the time, and inevitably somebody comes up to me at the party and they say, you know, my daughter is a brilliant writer or she might be a gymnast, will you have lunch with her every week uh, to see if maybe she wants to be a gymnast? Or they say, my daughter was the best writer in the history of her high school. She has three kids now and she's a stay-at-home mom, but she is a much better writer. You know, the implication, she's a much better writer than you ever were. Uh, but she's just been really, really busy with her kids, or I've been busy with my kids, and that's why I haven't been writing. Uh, and then at some point, a neurosurgeon walks up to me and says, I'm so glad to meet you because I am going to write a novel. I've decided I'm going to start writing a novel on Wednesday afternoons. And, um, and I was just wondering if you could give me some tips. And I'm like, this is such an amazing coincidence because I'm going to start doing neurosurgery on Wednesday afternoons. <laughs> From like noon to four, if we could just have an office swap, that would be so cool. Why isn't what I do a job? The reason why what I, is, I do isn't a job is because we can all write. We can all make our letters, we can all type. Not only that, as human beings, we transfer our experience into stories. And every time we tell the story again, we don't go back to the original experience, we go back to the last time we told the story. And we shape it, and we shape it, and we shape it. So we have these two abilities. We live through story. We live by shaping our experience into stories that we tell to one another, and we know how to operate the pencil. So you have the wonderful idea in your head, and you have the ability to take it out with your hand. So why doesn't it work more often? Why do we feel so defeated? Why have we all had the experience, even if it's just sending an email, of sitting down, typing a sentence, and thinking, that's not what's in my head. That's not the beautiful, important thing I mean to say. This is absolutely junk because we don't think that it's something that's worthy of practice because we don't think of it the way Yo-Yo Ma thinks of playing the cello, that you have to pick it up and do it boring hour after boring hour, day after week after month after year. We say, no, I have writer's block. You don't have writer's block. My husband doesn't say, you know, this guy, he's got leukemia, it's really complicated, I don't know what medicine, I, I've got doctor's block, I just can't, I'm not going to go in today, I've, I've blocked. You know what? He, he's blocked, it's hard. And if you're blocked and it's hard, then you do the work and you sit down and you figure it out. And maybe it'll take you a day and maybe it'll take you a year. But that's what you do. You don't get math block. You say, this is a very hard proof, and I'm going to need to solve it. So you stick with it. Now, as it was said in the introduction, I own a bookstore in Nashville, Parnassus Books. And a couple of years ago, this is my last story about hard work. A couple of years ago, in uh, 2012, the American Booksellers Association awarded me Most Engaging Author of the Year. Now. The way this works, they have the best paperback, best nonfiction, best children's book, best novel, blah, blah, blah. And then the last prize, the big prize, the huge, very important prize, the prom queen of the American Booksellers Association wins most engaging author of the year. Well, of course, I did deserve it because I opened a bookstore and I spent the whole year going pretty much around the world talking about the importance of independent bookstores. And they said, we want you to give a speech to the American Booksellers Association. This is like a couple of thousand people in the Javits Center in New York. And I really wanted to give them a present. I wanted to, I wanted to really hand them something because these are people that I love and I've worked with all my life. And I wanted to inspire them and to rally them and to empower them. And so I was thinking, what of all the things that we know is the most inspiring, the most rallying, of course, you would all say, Henry V, 
Um, the Hundred Years' War, the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, and the, the speech in which Henry V rallies his troops, his very small band of Englishmen in France who were going in to be slaughtered by the huge French forces, which is not unlike the situation with Amazon bearing down on the tiny little booksellers. The tiny little booksellers are the English, and Amazon are the French. And so I think what I'm going to do, and I'm going to give this as a gift, I'm going to memorize the St. Crispin's Day speech, and I'm going to give it to the booksellers. And so I, I think this is good. I write it all down on index cards. And my husband and I are going to Mississippi. He's from Mississippi. And his mother lives down there. She has a little fishing cabin on a pond, which they call a lake, which it's not. And I've got my index cards with, with the Henry V St. Crispin's Day speech. And all the way down to Mississippi, I'm going, what's he that wishes so? What's he that wishes so? What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland. What's he that wishes so, my cousin Westmoreland? And I go around the pond. What's he that wishes so, my cousin Westmoreland? What's he that wishes so, my cousin Westmoreland? And Carl's like, seriously? We're going to do this for three days? <laughs> I can't get it. I cannot get it. I can't get it. I feel like I am sticking a screwdriver in my ear. It hurts. The extent to which I cannot memorize Shakespeare hurts me. I have it on the sink when I'm brushing my teeth. I have it on the planes. What he that wishes so, my cousin West. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm, I am handicapped in some way. It is beyond my ability. I can't do this. I try, I try. I carry these note cards everywhere. The date is coming closer and closer. I've got to give this speech. Although I haven't told anybody. I just want to give this speech. Well, then I do this program at Symphony Space in New York. It's a radio show. And what they do is they have a featured author, but they hire an actress. And the actress comes and gives a reading from your work, and then you talk about your work. So the actress was a young woman named Marin Ireland, who's on Homeland, and she's on a bunch of different shows. And we're sitting back in the green, lamp, and in the green room before the show, and she's very nice. And I said, so Marin, what are you going to do this summer? And she said, oh, um, I'm doing Shakespeare. I'm doing Troilus and Cressida. I'm, I'm Cressida. I'm going to do it out in, in Portland. I said, really? Well, <laughs> that's kind of a crazy coincidence, because actually, I'm, I'm doing Shakespeare, too. Um, yeah, wow. Well, we could talk, you know? And she was like, really? I said, yeah, you know, Marin, I mean, since we're just back here waiting one Shakespearean person to another. Um, I'm just really curious, how do you memorize it? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do you memorize Shakespeare? Like, what's the trick, right? She was like, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was like, well, you know, it's, it's hard for me because I, I don't know the trick. So if you could just tell me what the trick is so I could do it, that would be, that would be super helpful. And she was like, oh, oh, I get it, the trick? You want to know the trick for memorizing Shakespeare? She was like, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that. She was like, you get an apartment, and uh, your friends say that they're going to come over and read lines for you. They don't ever come over. And she was like, your boyfriend, he leaves you over the course of the summer because you never come out of your apartment because all you do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is this. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are and now to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will. Wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desire. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No, faith, my cuz, wish not one man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share from me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, 
that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company who fears his fellowship to die with us. Today is called the Feast of Crispian. He that shall outlive this day and come safe home shall stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age shall yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors, saying, tomorrow is St. Crispian's. Then shall he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then will our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world that we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be him ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's my best party trick now. Uh, so guys, you know what that makes me? It makes me a neurosurgeon. <laughs> you know what? That's true. That's true because even as I say this, even as I do this, I look at the people around me who can do things that I can't do and I think it's easy for them. And you're going to walk out of here thinking that was easy for me. It almost killed me. <laughs> it's work. And that's the good news and the bad news. Because if you are waiting around for inspiration to do the thing that you want most in your life, and it doesn't come, then it's really not your fault and it's not your responsibility. But if you believe that you can get what you want in this life by working for it, then you can have what you want. Da uh, David Sedaris, when he goes on tour, he takes one paperback book with him and he sells it every night. David Sedaris, the nicest, because I've had him at my bookstore, hardest working human being, most generous soul on the planet, did a 45 city book tour, 45 cities in 45 consecutive days at bookstores. I've had him at my store. He was going on at 6 o'clock. He got there at 4 to sign books for people who were early. We gave out numbers. We broadcast him out into the parking lot. He signed books until 2 o'clock in the morning. He was astonishing. So every night for the last 45 nights, he has sold the paperback of my new book, This is the Story of a Happy Marriage. And I have had people from all over the country call me and say, what are you doing for David Sedaris? Because I sure know what he's doing for you. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to ask you, what do you think of the state of journalism as a former magazine and nonfiction writer? I'm thinking mainly of the debacle with Rolling Stone, where everybody wanted to believe the worst case. And now they're backtracking. And you ask, how could something like that even have been published without the editors assuming responsibility. Look at history, man. Look at history. We've been messing up from day one. From the time of the printing press, we've been getting it wrong. I have three words for you. Dewey defeats Truman. <laughs> yes, sir. Are your books Uh, my books, 
you know, it depends on your Barnes and Noble. Owning a bookstore, usually nobody has everybody's book. I mean, all of everybody's book. My books are all in print. So if there's anything that a bookstore doesn't have, you can always order it. Or you can order it off ParnassusBooks.net, and it'll be signed and shipped to you. What? Dot net. Par ParnassusBooks.net. And I also have a really great book blog and everything I read that I recommend. So if you ever, and, and I always want to say support your bookstore, not my bookstore. But if you want a recommendation of something to read, do go to the website. But yeah, you can get all of my books anywhere. And my, my new book just came out in paperback, and I'm on page 93 of a new novel. So. I loved you before today, and I think I worship you now. Oh, that's uh, nice. Thank and you. And I'm so glad I brought And I actually worship your daughter, who is extraordinarily good through all of this. Well, and I brought her today because one of my favorite works that you've done is your commencement address oh, at thanks. Sarah Lawrence College. And I brought a copy of that for you to sign for her today. I was telling her about it, about what it meant, why you went to go talk to them, that you were talking about what now, what next. And she had a great question for you about it. How do you know everything? <laughs> <laughs> Would you call my dad and tell him that? Uh, <laughs> I don't. I, um, it's all about authority. It's all about looking like you know everything. It's all about standing up straight with your shoulders back and looking like you belong at the party. Then everybody thinks you know everything. I don't know where you are. You're, you're the disembodied voice. Okay, all right, hey, hi. No, Joseph Campbell uh, retired from Sarah Lawrence in, I think, 1978, and I got there in 1981. But it is the question most people ask me, and a great sadness. I mean, everybody who ever watched his videos or read his books is a huge fan of Joseph Campbell, but I actually never met him in person. Well, I just wanted to tell you how much uh, the short essay meant on the dog. Thank you. And your mother. Yeah. Because that was exactly my situation. And it added so much to, to me. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was that. a grandmother. In my case, it was a mother. Yes. yes. Um, there, there are two essays in that book that have really been the two essays that have been the most meaningful to people. One about my dog who died. There's right, right here in front. Uh, one about my dog who died and one about my taking care of my grandmother while she was dying. Um, and you know, it's, it's really been nice. It's the thing about writing nonfiction. And I am a fiction writer. I'm absolutely a novelist. That's where my heart is. But when you write something in nonfiction, something that happened to you, and people will come up to me and say, I was so comforted by that. That really helped. Um, it makes me feel like, well, I should be doing this instead. It's good. Balance. Yes. Um, I've been reporting and writing for newspapers for 25 years. And I'm just wondering if you have any advice for how to reach readers, especially younger readers, and do you really think that newspapers are dying? Like, how sh what should we do to capture people while still maintaining our, our credibility? You know, the, um, newspapers are certainly struggling. There are a lot of things that are struggling. I think that they die when we let them die. And a lot of it is you've just got to keep doing the best job you can do. All you can do is the part that you can control. And what I like to say about reading, apparently studies show reading to your children doesn't really do anything for them. I don't think my parents ever read me a book. But what happened is my parents read in front of me and told me to go away while they were reading. Um, <laughs> I will always remember when I was eight years old and my father was reading The Godfather and he was like, they cut the horse's head off and put it in the guy's bed. That was worth more than three little pigs could ever be. So not only keep up with the writing and the best writing you can do, but also let people see you reading. Let people see you. Don't just always be on your phone. So sick of those phones. Um, sit there with a the newspaper and talk to people about what's in the newspaper. I mean, really all we have are our grassroots. But as somebody who has opened a bookstore when everybody's telling me that bookstores are dead, you know, I, I can also tell you that grassroots really work. And, and I read the Tulsa paper this morning, and you guys have a real paper. A Nashville, ugh. May they, may they bury the Tennessean. May they wrap dead fish with it and throw it out. It's a Gannett paper. Yes. How much research do you do for your books? Um, 
do you get caught up in the research and start losing track and have to make yourself get back to the writing process? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And what I do to avoid doing that, I do my research either when I'm about two-thirds of the way through a book or when I'm finished with a book. I use the research, no, seriously, I use the research to correct myself. So I write it wrong, and then I do the research and go back. Because not only, research is the La Brea Tar Pits. You will walk in and you will not walk out. You, they will find your fossilized bones three centuries from now, reading those books on evolutionary biology that you always should have read. So if you can do your research sort of out of order, for me, that's what really works. Also, there's nothing in the world that I hate more than reading a book in which the author has clearly done, and I'm talking about fiction, an enormous amount of research, and by God, he wants you to know. <laughs> he wants you to suffer through every single piece of research he's done because he did it. I cannot bear that. Right in the middle, yes. Oh, you've got your microphone. What was my favorite book when I was little? Charlotte's Web. Charlotte's Web. I would get to the end and I would just turn it over and start it again. And I begged, 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 begged my parents to give me a pig. And we lived in the country. And for my ninth birthday, my stepfather got me a pig. He took me out to a pig farm and I got to pick out a pig. And they put it in a burlap sack and they tied a knot. It was a little pig. It was the size of my dog. And they put it in the back seat. And his name was Arnold, uh, which is embarrassing. And, um, and it was not the days of the cute little Vietnamese potbelly pig. This turned out to be a 350-pound pig. Uh, but because of that book, this is how reading changes your life. When I was nine years old, I became a vegetarian because that pig was my friend, and I don't eat my friends. Yes? What comes to you first, the title or the story? Oh, um, the story... Every now and then I get a title, you know, really early on, but I don't think that I've ever just gotten a, a disembodied title and thought, oh, I wonder what that's about, you know. Uh, although it's a good idea. We have one over here. You can, but the mic is right here, so. Okay, I'll take it. Okay. Um, so I read this book called All Things Shining, and it contrasts Elizabeth Gilbert to David Foster Wallace. Yeah. on the inspiration spectrum, in which, as you had said, she's like a, she feels as if there's muses and they flow through her and she gets these inspirations, right. whereas he's ex nihilo and it comes from himself. And I got the sense from what you were saying about work, that you were closer to the David Foster Wallace end of that spectrum. I was curious where you felt like muses or it comes purely out of yourself or... Um, David was a real good friend of mine. And um, it, it's... I know him, knew him well enough to say there was nothing about our, uh, the way we worked that was similar because the way he worked was insanity itself. I, if he had a magazine article due that was 2,000 words, he would write 500 pages. Uh, so there, I mean, he, had, he, he worked off of this hypermania, work, 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 but kind of couldn't ever pull it back. David was crazy. Um, he was, you know, and I loved him very much, but he was crazy. And, and Liz, <laughs> oddly enough, who you would look at the two of them next to each other and you would say, oh man, she's crazy. And he's got both feet on the ground. Isn't that weird to think of the two of them together? Because she is sanity itself, reliability, count on Liz Gilbert, and, and Dave killed himself. So, um, and, and amazing that he didn't kill himself 30 years before he killed himself. So, sometimes it's just not quite what you think it is. But I, I'm grateful that you actually brought up two people who are very important in my life because I can compare and contrast them. Make it count. <laughs> the pressure's on. This may not count. In your, in your story, uh, your novel, Bel Canto, uh -huh. did you have a specific opera singer? Because I always thought of Renee Fleming when I was... You know, I didn't have a specific opera singer in mind for Bel Canto because I didn't know enough about opera. I was taking a crash course at the time. But through a weird set of coincidences, I ended up writing 
somebody who was Renee Fleming, and now Renee Fleming is one of my best friends. I'm going to answer this question of this woman in the front, and then we'll wrap it up. Shout it out. What now, what next? Well, I'm on page 93. Um, I'm, uh, I have been on a long run of this kind of thing. I have been up on the stage since the beginning of October, and this is going to stop really soon, the end of December. And then I have January and February off. I'll go back to the book. I'll do this again in March. You know, it's just kind of finding balance in life between being somebody who's really, really public. And, um, you know, people think, oh, it's so glamorous. It's so good. And then I go home and I'm really a housewife and I'm just doing the laundry and making dinner and writing a novel during the day. And then I go back out again and I put mascara on, although I didn't find it this morning. Um, <laughs> you know, that's kind of basically what it boils down to. Time in my life when I wear makeup, time in my life when I don't wear makeup. <laughs> Um, thank you. Oh, let me, wait, 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 wait. Let me tell you one more thing. I have to catch a plane. Um, and I want to sign your books. So this is what I am going to ask you. Open the books to the title page, which is the page with the name of the book and my name on it. If it is humanly possible that you can make do with just my signature, because otherwise I'm not going to get everybody's book signed, let me just write my name in your book. If you must have me say, happy birthday, Aunt Sally, I will do that. But just, just be kind, because otherwise I'll miss my plane. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want some water? No. Okay. All right. So thank you all for coming. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, Anne mentioned um, there are books for sale in the lobby from Barnes & Noble, if you would like. And she'll be signing in Frostard Auditorium, which is the room here. And uh, if you could be kind to her, we'd appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming this morning.